Thank you very much. Air Chief Marshal Vivek Ram Chaudhary, PVSM, AVSM, VM, ADC, Chief of the Indian Air Force, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to have you all with us this morning and a very warm welcome to a special session with Air Chief Marshal Vivek Ram Chaudhary, PVSM, AVSM, VM, ADC, and Chief of the Indian Air Force. Air Chief Marshal Chaudhary, it's been a pleasure to have you on the IMA platform and many thanks for agreeing to do this session. You are an alumnus of the NDA and you've been an outstanding fighter pilot, flying instructor and combat leader. You have flown more than 3,800 flying hours in a variety of fighter aircrafts, including the Su-30 MKI, MiG-29, MiG-23 MF, and the MiG-21. You were a member of the pioneer Surya Kiran acrobatic display team, and you have been involved in Operation Meghdoot in Siachen and Operation Safed Sagar in Kargil. You have also led India's aerial response to the Chinese incursion in the Indian Himalayas. You have received multiple honors for your distinguished service to the Indian Air Force, including the Vayu Seva Medal, the Ati Vishisht Seva Medal, and the Param Vishisht Seva Medal. It is a tremendous honor for us to have you with us. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a round of applause for the Air Chief Marshal. Thank you. IMA has enjoyed a close association with the armed forces, especially the Indian Army for several years. IMA facilitates industry visits and interactions for officers of the Office of the College of Defense Management, Secunderabad, as part of their higher defense management course curriculum. IMA has also had engagements with the Army Think Tank, CLAWS, and contributed to many of its leadership events. IMA has also launched a series of IMA Indian Army Collaborative Management Programs as a platform for India Inc. to learn more from the Indian Army and vice versa. One such program has been held at Joshi Math Army Post with the next planned in Ladakh. IMA would be very keen to collaborate with the Indian Air Force as well and to find areas of mutual benefit in the management and leadership domains. Ladies and gentlemen, Indian Air Force is becoming central to the country's security as air superiority is critical to the control of territories and winning wars. With satellites providing intelligence and direction and missiles traveling hundreds and thousands of kilometers, controlling the skies has become a basic requirement of modern warfare. In fact, the Indian Air Force has been critical to India's security operations in Siachen, Kargil, and Ladakh. However, its job is set to become more challenging as India faces the prospect of a multi-front war and the world gets embroiled in bigger and nastier conflicts. The frequency, intensity, and coverage of economic and military wars have been rising since the beginning of this millennium. The causes, the spread, the size, and the manner of war have grown steadily in the past couple of decades. And now we are practically in the third global war with a mutually destructive standoff between Russia and the Western Bloc. The shift of the world order from a unipolar one to a multipolar one is catalyzing a test of strength between the incumbent and the rising powers, and also between the rising powers themselves. The present churn in geopolitics has escalated India's security concerns, and the Indian form armed forces have no option but to bulk up and smarten up quickly. IAF is now a big priority for the government, and the instant purchase and rapid induction of the Rafale indicates the government's focus on the Indian armed, uh, armed forces. The IAF is also trying to reduce dependence on others for war machines and inducted a large number of homemade Tejas aircrafts. It is also looking to build fighting capacity in space as air superiority is becoming dependent on satellites and anti-satellite weapons. The future of air warfare is inextricably linked to digital technologies, and the AIF is set for a big upgrade in automation and various AI technologies. Today we are privileged to have the Air Chief staff with us, and we are eager to hear from him on the future of air warfare and the Indian Space Force's preparedness for that. With these words, it's my pleasure to invite Air Chief Marshal Vivek Ram Chaudhary, PVSM, AVSM, VM, ADC, and Chief of the Indian Air Force to deliver some brief opening remarks, following which, with your permission, sir, we'd open it for questions and answers, and hopefully have the time to get some questions in from the audience as well. Of course, sir.
Mr. Nikhil Sani, Vice President IMA, Mr. Sanjeev Goenka, Chairman of the Conclave, Mr. C.K. Ranganathan, President IMA, Ms. Rekha Sethi, Director General IMA, esteemed guests, members of the media, all participants at the Conclave, ladies and gentlemen, good morning to all of you. It's indeed a pleasure for me to stand amongst all of you and deliver a key note address. I have been asked to speak on the future of air warfare, securing the skies and beyond. The future of aerial warfare is something vociferously being discussed and debated across the aeronautical fraternity, strategists and academia. But before I delve into the topic, I would like to take you all to the definition of a black swan event as espoused by famous author Nassim Nicholas Taleb and I quote, it is an event that is so rare that even the possibility that it might occur is unknown. It has a catastrophic impact when it does occur and it's always explained in hindsight as if it were actually predictable." Unquote. In the last two years, the world has witnessed another black swan event in the form of COVID-19. Nobody in the world predicted it. The impact of the virus has been catastrophic across the world and we are still developing a theory on the origins of this virus. Similarly, in the last 20 years or so, we have seen unprecedented developments in technology which have totally changed the way we live, socialize and work. Our social media followers are as much a part of our life as our immediate family. Our increasing reliance on technology has reached such a state where the modern generation is more likely to ask Siri if it is daylight outside rather than opening the windows to see if it is. Funnily enough, and no pun intended, opening windows has a totally different connotation today as compared to what we thought in the 80s and 90s. Let me give you an example to highlight my point. If I were to take away all your cell phones and communication devices and then ask you to organize a company get together this evening, imagine the trepidation that would follow. Similarly, with the advent of internet and social media platforms, the world has become a very small place. And ladies and gentlemen, traditionally, we always looked at a soldier in the battlefield, a sailor on a ship, or an airman in an aircraft as combatants who will fight wars. A college student creating memes, a youngster, 25-year-old, sitting in front of a computer, a banker analyzing the physical health of a company, a diplomat making foreign policy, and a politician. All of them and many more would also be the combatants waging tomorrow's wars alongside the soldier, sailor, and airman. This brings me to the term comprehensive national power, which is the sum total of the diplomatic, information, military, and economic heft of a country. In modern warfare, the comprehensive national power of a country must be brought to bear on the adversary if we were to want a decisive victory. Because, in the words of Bernard Russell, war does not determine who is right, only who is left. Traditionally, wars have been fought on the land, at sea, in the air, and to some extent in space. In the past two decades, this spectrum has increased to encompass cyber and information domains. The first four domains are classically physical and the other two are virtual. The overarching effect of cyber and information on the conduct of conventional wars has created a new hybrid and multi-domain spectrum of conflict resulting in older tactics and strategies becoming passe. Therefore, to secure our borders, there is a definite imperative to reimagine, reform, redesign and rebuild our traditional warfighting machinery and adapt to this new emerging paradigm. Cyber and information have become the modern tools for shaping the battlefield. A well-created narrative in the information domain to adversely affect the enemy can have devastating effects. As we've become more and more interconnected, a cyber attack on our networks can cripple command and control structures. What I'm trying to get at is that in the next war, the enemy might not be a country or an organization. 
we may never know what we may never know the perpetrators of a distributed denial of services attack and we will not know when and from where the attack will take place in future we could be attacked on all fronts ranging from economic strangulation to diplomatic isolation to military standoffs to information blackouts all in the form of attacks by what is called distributed denial of services all this will happen well before the first bullet is fired or the first aircraft goes across the border future warfare is likely to be hybrid in nature and the spectrum of conflict will be spread across all domains spanning from conventional to non conventional kinetic to non kinetic lethal to non lethal all under a nuclear overhang the weapons we are looking at would be ranging from a small computer virus to hypersonic missiles ladies and gentlemen there is a need for us to develop capabilities across the full spectrum of conflict and focus on multi multi domain operations similarly our doctrines equipment training and tactics will have to be flexible and to be able to adapt rapidly to these new challenges we in the indian air force during the last two years have also had our own set of challenges during the peak of the pandemic the situation in eastern ladakh also unfolded the indian air force was on high alert while simultaneously providing full support to the nation's fight against covid let me give you some facts and figures to bring out the enormity of effort put in our transport aircraft fleet flew to 18 countries clocking about 4800 flying hours almost 2900 sorties distributing aids to our friends across the globe additionally we flew about 2600 hours within the country for transportation and positioning of oxygen cylinders and medical supplies in 3 or 4 months we covered a total distance of almost 27 lakh nautical miles to put it in perspective this is like going to the moon and back four times all this was in addition to the threat on our northern borders while maintaining a 24/7 readiness to cater for any eventuality during the recent operation ganga we flew 240 hours to four countries to fly back our fellow citizens from the war torn region even as i speak now we have five of our helicopters carrying out daring aerial rescue from the stranded cable cars in jharkhand all this is made possible due to the resolve and selfless attitude displayed by the men and women in blue backed by a strong and firm leadership at all levels to meet the laid down objectives so what is the way ahead what are the plans for the indian air force to be ready to fight and win tomorrow's wars conflicts in the last few decades have clearly established without doubt the preeminence of air power as the instrument of choice for almost all the operational contingencies the tactical advantage that the high ground offers is a must achieve criteria even today in this aspect air power provides that high ground and ability to bypass the fielded forces to hit targets in great depths with speed and precision in more recent times space has been increasingly exploited as it provides the ultimate high ground where a nation's forces can operate with near impunity the accrued ability to see and comprehend the enemy's disposition and design provides a commander with an ability to decide and act quickly such a process in military terms is known as the ooda loop o o d a ooda loop a term coined by an american um, air force officer colonel john boyd in short what it means ooda stands for observe orient decide and act the idea is a shortened ooda loop will provide a commander with an opportunity to take an initiative and retain it the longer the ooda loop the less likely of success in any battlefield the idea is to keep the enemy always in the observe and orient phase let him keep guessing as to where the next attack is going to come from and in what form it is going to come from while simultaneously keeping our own ooda loop as short as possible to be able to react quickly to be able to decide quickly and to be able to take 
counter action immediately. So in all this, air power fits in most seamlessly to be able to provide the shortest CUDA loop for any military commander. In the fog of war, there is a need to get as clear a picture as possible of the battle space and intentions of the adversary. This would give a high degree of flexibility to the commander at the operational level to make dynamic changes and to what we call shape the battlefield. This ability rides on the backbone of highly secure and efficient networks that integrate sensors, decision makers and the shooters. Our network-centric capability seamlessly fuses all elements of war fighting to create a very high level of shared battle space awareness. The key component of this capability are all interconnected in the same loop. The sensors, what we call sensors, are the radars, surveillance platforms, you may have heard of a term called AVAX, satellites and so on. So these form the sensors. The shooters are the fighter aircraft, the missiles, the surface to air, air to ground missiles. And lastly are the decision makers, the people who will take a decision when to press the button. All these have to be fully networked at all times. So we are actively pursuing development of niche technologies in the field of space-based capabilities, data linking, and AI-based decision support systems to ensure that our sensor to shooter loop is kept as short as it can be. Easy accessibility of high-end technology also poses new challenges to the conventional forces. Harassment through the use of drones in the Yemeni Saudi tussle, use of drones alongside fighter aircraft in Azerbaijan Armenia conflict, and unconfirmed reports of Ukrainians using drones against Russian forces are all indicative of the equipment of future wars. We also have doctrinally included drone usage in our scheme of operations to benefit from some of the exclusive attributes of these platforms. At the same time, we are pursuing unmanned combat systems and their integration with manned fighter platforms in what is known as man-machine teaming. At the ed other end of the spectrum are the hypersonic weapons. There are reports of some of these being used in the ongoing Russian-Ukrainian conflict. Due to very high speeds, these missiles are difficult to intercept, making the existing air defense systems redundant. The Air Force is actively involved in research and development for such weapons and in developing countermeasures. We have laid out a roadmap to add new capabilities and harness modern technology, making technological invention innovation an integral part of our security apparatus. This thought has initiated a process of re-equipping, retraining, and remodeling of our security infrastructure. A potent Air Force in the future will be characterized by aspects of persistent presence, multi-role capabilities, rapid deployment, spectrum dominance, centricity of information management, precision targeting, and rapid innovation for creating asymmetry. The unique combination of the developing capabilities, operational concepts, and technological opportunities has created a situation where air power will play a very crucial role to overcome the rapid changes in the character and conduct of war. At the same time, we are hugely cognizant of the fact that no nation can be truly sovereign without meeting its basic needs from indigenous sources. This applies greatly to the defense needs also. The Indian Air Force has started sourcing a large portion of its equipment from national entities, which is a significant achievement, and this trend will only increase in the coming years. The Atmanirbhar Bharat and Make in India programs will bolster indigenous defense manufacturing in the country. We need to focus more on research and development with an aim to manufacture on our own, rather than relying on minor indigenization of foreign products. The government has been very supportive to this cause and has taken giant steps in supporting the Indian companies and academia with necessary policy formulation and by providing a conducive environment. I have no doubt in my mind that our industry partners, MSMEs, academia and think tanks will give full impetus in realizing India's aspiration of achieving strategic autonomy in defense production. Last, but definitely not the least, is the importance of the man and woman behind the machine. Multi-skilling our personnel has become the need of the hour 
to enable them to take decisions spanning the vast spectrum of operations that we are likely to undertake. Here I would like to hasten to act that the Indian Air Force is truly a gender agnostic service today with women serving in every branch of the Indian Air Force. As a nation, <laughs> there is a need for a strong and robust strategic communication. It should be made clear to the world today that today's India has the capability and more importantly, the will to respond at a level that we deem appropriate and to define our own escalation matrix. We, the men and women in uniform, are the cutting edge of that response. Therefore, it is imperative that we keep that edge as sharp and lethal as possible. And I can assure you that the Indian Air Force continuously strives to remain a potent force. Thank you and Jai Hind. Thank you very much, Air Chief Marshal. Uh, with your permission, could, could, could I ask you some questions? And I also have some questions that have come from the audience and some more will come. Uh, the many questions that come to mind with your speech, sir, and first amongst those is the, the breadth of the threats and the breadth of the capabilities that the Indian Armed Forces and especially the, uh, the Indian Air Force also needs to acquire both from a perspective of hard infrastructure as well as soft infrastructure and training. Management question that all of us managers in this room deal with is how do we allocate capital, both in terms of money as well as time, in terms of thought. How do you, how do you foresee problems like that? How do you evaluate problems like that as, in terms of putting money between, into artificial intelligence and AI? versus hard capabilities and drones versus hypersonic missiles and, and managerially, how would you manage that, sir? Let me uh, begin by saying, uh, I think we have learned the hard way because of our dependence on far too many sources of hardware all through our existence. Today we operate almost 39 different types of aircraft with origins in six different countries. First of all, managing a huge inventory itself is a big challenge for us. But we have learned to overcome the challenges by uh, innovative methods and uh, more importantly, being flexible in our thought. Every new conflict or every new dimension of warfare that has emerged in the last two decades has made us relook and redefine our priorities. In the past, we were always focusing on hardware and getting more platforms and more you know, equipment. Today, the focus is shifting towards software, towards data fusion, towards artificial intelligence, and so on. And this is a continuously um, changing process. So we, though we have what we call it uh, every two-year sort of an um, acquisition plan that we make out, but uh, unfortunately, it's very difficult to stick to that because of the changing nature of conflict and the new dimensions of warfare that keep emerging. Thank you very much. So I'd like to step back a second with some questions that have come from the audience, which is on, 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 so how do you, uh, the role you'd said of the Indian Armed Forces in COVID in terms of operations that you'd ra run, and there's a question that's come in, and it, is that how do you categorize COVID-19 pan pandemic as a bio-warfare or as an air warfare? And what is the role of the Air Force in such air warfare? How may you combat it? Uh, I think that you have already said that the number of sorties that were run, but is there anything more that you'd like to add in terms of the Indian Armed Forces itself and how it is such a large organization? How did it deal with COVID internally? What were the tools that you faced as a leader in terms of ensuring the safety and security of the personnel as well as their loved ones? Yeah, for example, the um, COVID hit us at the time when we were deployed along our northern borders. And uh, we are very grateful actually for the, for the government to have recognized us as frontline workers. So we were among the first to be vaccinated. And uh, we also were fortunate that we, we could, um, you know, affect a lockdown very easily in most of our Air Force bases. Most of them being a little isolated and, you know, secure campuses. So we could enforce lockdowns. To, uh, to ensure that the uh, spread of COVID was contained within the campuses. And uh, we've had the, the most minimal number of cases within the armed forces. 
So uh, I think we battled that uh, very well thanks to uh, the timely vaccination and our containment and um, you know precautionary measures that we took. Thank you very much. So I want to start with uh, a, a question about yourself. Uh, you have a very storied journey within the armed forces, which I already alluded to in my opening remarks, as a fighter pilot as well as a leader. Can you tell us a little bit about the influences and motivations that you've had personally in your life, which has led you here? And, and what took you through the NDA and then to the Indian Air Force? How did you make those decisions to, to, to be in this position? Because a lot of our, 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 peop, our youth who are watching this on a virtual platform, as well as some of them who are in the room today, uh, need, are trying to make decisions to, to, on their careers and especially switching careers. You don't see people switching into a, a career in the army later on in life. What opportunities may exist for other people? But personally, if we could understand from your personal experiences first, it would give an insight into a lot of our uh, colleagues here in terms of what opportunities exist. Very interesting one. Uh, I, I think, um, you know, I, we happened to join the National Defense Academy at the age when I was barely 16 years old. And uh, I think the fascination towards um, being able to fly an aeroplane to get a chance to be, uh, you know, a a among the legends of the uh, wars because we brought up on the uh, hearing stories of the 1971 war which had just happened a few years prior to me joining the academy. So um, that was one of some of the inspirational um, matters that thought that it's a good career to, uh, to pursue. Of course, the challenges are there and uh, I have never been a status quoist. I come from a family of engineers and, uh, you know, it was um, looked down upon to do something other than engineering. So, um, <laughs> any case, I, I wanted to be an outlier probably and uh, do something different and challenging. Uh, sir, uh, no, no career can be as noble as uh, uh, serving the country. So, thank you for that. But carry on from those, from, the, from, from, from your comments. Are there possibilities of, of people laterally coming into the armed forces later in their careers if they feel that they can contribute both managerially or in terms of specific capabilities? How do you see in individual organization-led collaborations exist? And I think they exist institutionally, both within the Ministry of Defense as well as through specific uh, uh, verticals of the armed forces. How do you see individuals collaborate? Everyone wants to contribute, and I think that over the past couple of years, what we've found is that everyone has had a deep sense of nationalism and patriotism to the, the plight of the country. And, and what has been heightened even more is in our northern borders what, what have taken place. What is the possibility of individual cooperation and individuals' uh, capabilities being utilized to, to be harnessed within the, this ecosystem? Uh, the one uh, unique factor which sets the Defence Forces apart from the uh, corporate world is that uh, we do not have a lateral entry system. Everybody who joins, joins in very early in life and gets moulded towards the military way of life uh, well before he's past his teens, his or her teens. So um, that, that's the way the, the beginning is made in the armed forces. Uh, the um, collaboration with the um, industry, academia, management institutes and so on does take place in a very formalized manner across various stages of career in terms of what we call professional military education, mid-course learning programs and so on, mid-career learning programs. But uh, definitely today's world has um, opened up many opportunities for individuals to interact with uh, the academia and the industry our thrust on, like I said, Make in India, there are so many opportunities that have been um, thrown up with this new, um, you know, new, new uh, shift in our policy. So we now have individuals who are getting enmeshed with bigger organizations. Earlier, we used to only interact with the DPSUs, for example, with HAL or with BEL and things. Now we have people reaching out to the industry and vice versa. Similarly, from the management, since we've been talking to the IMAB, I can say that there is a lot to learn from each other. You know, we, our management skills are totally different. You know, we talk on leadership skills rather than management. And, but yet, there is so much to learn, whether it is, um, you know, quality control, whether it is uh, management of human beings, more importantly, managing the millennials. 
we also face the same uh, challenges in managing the millennials who think differently. The leaders are of a, we are of a different generation. We are of the, uh, what, what you call the uh, baby boomer generation, the 70s and 80s generation. And the, the people, the mass of the Air Force today are the millennials. So there is a lot to learn from how the uh, corporate world is dealing with these millennials now. I, I agree, sir. The, I mean, that, that's a question that everyone is grappling with and the true use case of cryptocurrencies and all of those virtual assets that exist in terms of NFTs, I can't get my head around. So I, 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 I'm sure that in some capacity or the other, those aspirations of the millennials are being met by the Indian Armed Forces and uh, to further their career and, and to provide the security that the country needs. Uh, sir, you talked about in your speech about collaboration with industry and as well as the government policy for Atmanirbhar Bharat and to indigenize both uh, the capacity and capability to build but also further enhance research and development on platforms so that we would uh, so that we are no longer reliant on, from a multi-decadal perspective on on the true security that the country needs so how do you believe that we that, that this partnership is at this point in time what do you think are the constraints? And if there are people in the audience who would be interested in, the, in this partnership, what is the way that they would go about actually even trying to develop uh, this relationship? Is it directly with the MOD or is it with the, the Indian Air Force? Or how, how do you foresee this relationship and how do you see next steps there? There, there are certain uh, guiding policy documents and uh, manuals. For example, there is a document called the Defense Acquisition Policy 2020, it's in short the DAP 2020. It's got new chapters on strategic partnerships, on make one program, make two, make three, the IDEX, we have technology development schemes. So a whole lot of new initiatives have come up in the last three or four years through which we are interacting very closely and directly with most of the MSMEs. From the Indian Force point of view, we carried out a unique competition about three years ago. We called it the Meher Baba drone competition in which we got uh, almost 150 participants from colleges and uh, MSMEs and small industries and um, finally we had home down to about 25 of them. We encouraged them to reach the, the finals of the competition and then we now directly interacting with three companies and in fact um, some of the drone shows that you see even on the um, beating retreat or around the country, most of these people were incubated sort of during this competition. So that is another way of beating the um, laborious uh, process of acquisition by having a competition amongst industry, amongst academia, and we are doing it directly with them. I think the IT, the, the IT industry has held many hackathons in a similar manner, and it's great to see that the armed forces are using similar tools to, to help build innovation and then adopt it also within the system. Uh, but, sir, as you talked about hypersonic missiles and the fact that so, that has come to, well, it's come out very recently only that uh, certain countries have used it and certain countries may be using it in the current conflict as well. Uh, there was recent news that the United States along with Australia and the United Kingdom would work together on developing a joint platform on this. How do you see India's role in cutting edge breakthrough technologies from an indigenous research and development perspective. Do we have the capacity right now? Is there direction that needs to be given for capabilities in, in rotor dynamics, fluid dynamics, etc., so that we can, we can build towards a true Atmanirbhar platform? Or should we also look at a collaborating platform with, multi, with different governments, which may be strategically uh, uh, important to us? And then obviously along with that comes the question that India has always followed this non-aligned policy and our, our current stance in Ukraine also says that. So how would we collaborate then? I mean, what is the basis on which that we're collaborating? Is it values or is it some type of uh, uh, capability based assessment? Actually, I think we have made a good head start in our uh, indigenous space program and also in our uh, indigenous missile development program. So hypersonics and all are more uh, offshoots of these programs. And it, in my opinion, it is best to remain indigenous with this and not go into collaboration with anybody. Even if it takes a finite amount of longer time, it is best to develop it in-house. 
That's the way the future should be. That's good.